Thank you very much, Colleen. And it indeed is on the topic of grace and love that actually is perfectly fitting for uh, the words that I want to share. And particularly because I know as it pertains to the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, I know many people have a very difficult time sometimes reconciling a God of grace and love with some of some parts of scripture. I know many of us who have uh, have a richly sort of explored God's word over our lifetime would say, what are you talking about? Of course, God's love is everywhere. But I also know that many of us do struggle uh, with many parts of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. It is an unfortunate but common understanding that sort of the New Testament is where God brings his love and his grace, all the things Colleen was talking about. But the Old Testament is all about sin and judgment and punishment and all that. And I think that is unfortunate. Because one of the things that I think that produces is a sort of a a difficulty in engaging the, the Bible, the whole Bible, old and new. We focus on the parts that feel the most uh, warm, and we kind of shy away from the parts that are more difficult. And again, to speak about the objective of this series, this series is entirely designed to help us pique our curiosity about the Bible and to perhaps receive from God an invitation to engage it a little more. Uh, And one of the ways that I hope to do that is helping by tracing the themes of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, uh, section by section. Many of us grow up in faith and have knowledge about certain stories, and this section of scripture that we're talking about today, Genesis 1 to 11, is a prime example. Because many of us will know the stories that are part of this section, we'll know the creation and fall. We'll know the story that we just we, that we just read. We'll know about Cain and Abel. We'll know about Noah and the ark, and we'll know about the Tower of Babel, which are indeed the stories that the major stories that are covered through Genesis one to eleven. But we often just know them as individual stories. We don't see the big picture that is coming there, coming through there. And and I think it's very important for us to understand what's going on there because there's a lot there that we might be missing. One of the things that I notice that I think is actually something of a good thing that's happening in our culture lately is an increased sensitivity towards the wrongs that are happening in the world. Now, I know that there's a lot of complexity too, especially as it pertains to our faith. But I, for one, consider it a blessing that many of us are now in this day and age a lot more aware of some of the grand evils that have been happening in the world. Just look at all the things that are being spoken about uh, in the news, on social media, this day and age. Talking about racism, talking about sexism, talking about oppression of one's form or other. People who, voices that have been marginalized and have been heard. Hatred that has been given to one group or another. And not to speak about whether we affirm one thing or another, but just the simple fact that people are, are feeling hatred for things that they feel completely out of their control for. Uh, mental health and the, and the increased burden of our, our emotions on ourselves and all, and all other manner of things that are happening around us. And I, for one, uh, think this is a good thing that we are increasingly thinking about what is the right thing to do in the world. But of course, the complexity comes is how do we as Christians navigate these questions of right and wrong? What exactly is the right thing to do? Because we, know, because we know that uh, a lot of folks will give us the answer if we ask out in the culture, what is the right thing, what is the wrong thing, what is happening to our society, and people will give you one answer or another as to what the rights and wrongs are. And I think this is where it's important for us to look at this section of Scripture. Because I think this section of Scripture, Genesis 1-11, to is describing the very thing that the culture has been des- de- describing for a while. In fact, we can say in one sense that we were the original ones to note the problem that they're showing. The overall theme of this section of scripture, Genesis 1 to 11, is describing a progressive, if you will, deterioration of the character of humanity. 
which I think is something that, again, the world out there will in some part agree with. There have been wrongs, ills, unrighteousness in society that have gone unchecked for too long, and it is about time for us to do something about it. And that's precisely what this section of Scripture is, uh, is illustrating. You have Adam and Eve. They do something that is completely against uh, the rules, the ways of the way of the living, and of course they had to be ejected from their, their position. We have similar things going on today where we have people not using their position of authority or power in a particular way, and we're seeking them to be ousted because they're not worthy of that. You have Cain and Abel, someone who, is, who reacts completely explosively to something that probably wasn't such a big deal, but indeed it was a murder for just simple jealousy. You have, so, you have a story a little bit later in Genesis 4, the story of Lamech, uh, which is something that's a story that's not often, it's not even a story, it's just a passing reference to this person named Lamech in Genesis 4, where he is actually descendant of Cain. And he is boasting, he is bragging about the extent to which he is even more vengeful than Cain, the progressive deterioration of the character of the world. Then you have Genesis chapter 6, where God observes humanity showing that there is no righteousness in any more people, and so, of course, it results in the complete doing away of the entire world and the rebooting, a continued deterioration. And then finally, in the story of the Tower of Babel, people who no longer want to look to God as the source of uh, uh, lifting up in praise. We have humanity coming together say, we want to do something that makes a name for ourselves. And we want to lift ourselves up in our pride, in our our awesomeness, and, and give glory to ourselves which again is something that many people today will, will, will recognize and also affirm, that there's are, there are too many folks out there who are wanting for themselves, building up for themselves, and not sharing around to everyone. So it's a similar diagnosis. But the, but the difference for us as Christians is where does the problem lie? And and this is precisely why we need to pay more attention to the whole scripture because this is important for us to be able to navigate these times. There is a lot of evil and ills in society, we know. But the problem, but the, the, the source of the problem is often put at the feet of many different things, at different ideologies or not having the right politics not thinking society should be organized, by not saying the right words or believing the right things. These are are said to be the sources of our ills for not recognizing the right thing. But the source of all the problems and the unrighteousness and the deterioration, we see the same problem, but 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 the Bible speaks to a different problem, a different source. See, in Genesis chapter 2, There was the tree of life, the source of righteousness, the source of all goodness. We were there in harmony, perfect justice, perfect righteousness. Everyone was treating one another with respect, and the world, the creation was being cared for. There was no pollution. There was everything was done in harmony with the earth and the creation had given. But then what happened? God said, the one tree that you can't eat from, what what was the tree that God... Anyone, what was the tree that the people could not eat from? The tree of? The the tree of life was not the one they couldn't eat one. What was the one that they couldn't eat from? The tree of? Now, I was wondering if some people would say the tree of good and evil, but it's not, in fact, the tree of good and evil. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, this is one thing, of course, one of the things that confuses us. Like, what is the deal with God not wanting us to have the knowledge of good and evil? Here is the point of this, here is what I see as the theme of this entire first section of Scripture. All of the problems of the world are essentially all the deterioration of society is being put at the foot of the fact that we, as humans, wanted to take the knowledge of good and evil for ourselves. We no longer wanted to trust God with the knowledge of good and evil. We wanted to take it for ourselves. We wanted to define right and wrong ourselves. We wanted to do right and wrong as we saw fit. 
And we can see that is the trajectory of society going forward from Cain and Abel to the people of Noah's day to Tower of Babel. The ongoing theme is the perpetuation that is the thing that started with the, with the tree, but it wasn't just Adam and Eve that took from the tree of the good and evil. It's everyone else and all their descendants who decided, I don't want to take the knowledge of good and evil from God. I want to take it for myself. I am the master. I am the Lord. I am the one that decides what's right and wrong for me. And this presents a challenge. Because while we, I am with the culture in trying to rid the world of all the unrighteousness that is out there, in many, in many cases, I f diverge in where the source of the problem is. Rather than relying on government or, uh, or social programs or ideologies or certain kinds of thinking, all of which can be good and can be fine. I'm not speaking against those things in general. A program here, a social thing there, a, a, an education program there might indeed help. But the true source of the problem is the taking of the knowledge of good and evil for self, which is what we call sin. The story of the first 11 chapters is that sin separated us from God. Now, sin is a sticky word. We often don't like the word because it comes with a lot of baggage. And in fact, the word sin is only used one time in this entire section of scriptures in chapter 4, uh, in reference to Cain. So it's not described, it's not using the word sin, but what is being described is sin. The sin of all sins, the idolatry, the taking of the mastery of the world and my life for myself and not allowing God to direct me. Sin separated for us from God, not as a punishment necessarily, but as our own choice. We chose to remove ourselves from God. We chose to take the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and we might think that the right response from God, because we often look at this section of Scripture and say, well, what we see from there, God, is God continually enacting his punishment on humanity. But in fact, even this section of Scripture tells a different story. We often think we have to wait until the incarnation, until Jesus, until the New Testament, until we start seeing the grace of God. But even throughout this story, we see God beginning the project of trying to not simply punish us for our wrongdoing, but reaching out to us in order to reclaim us from the, same, from the very sin that we are committing. In our sin, he is reaching out to us. Genesis 3.21 the Lord made garments for Adam and Eve. He could have easily said, Adam and Eve, I'm done with you. But he made clothes for them to care for them even as they left the garden. As Cain was being cursed and punished, if you will, for the murder of his, of his brother, you might think rightly so. God could have, would have smote him right there. Eye for an eye, right? You kill him, so I'm going to kill you. No. In Genesis 4.15, God says, not anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who, would be, who found him would kill him. He protected Cain, even in his sin. Even as God, it was stated that God regretted making the humanity and found that there is no one left righteous in the world. In Genesis 6, chapter 6, chapter six verses 6 to 8, the Lord says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God. And even then, God then said, after the flood and after the rebooting of humanity, he said, I will never do that again. It's a comp it, this is, of course, a complicated area of scripture. And though I know there are many questions to be had for it, it can't be really sa totally satisfied in this one sermon. But notice the grace that is being demonstrated here. God is limiting himself. He is limiting himself in his own power. He has the power to destroy all of this all over again, but he is limiting himself because he cares about humanity so much. He wants to do everything he can to reach out to us to bring, him, bring us back to him. And so he sends the rainbow as a sign that he will never do this again. And then, of course, the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is a very confusing story for many of us. I know myself, I've thought for many, many years 
What is the deal with God confusing our language? Why is it that God didn't want us to work towards a common goal? But notice what it says. It says that they wanted to make a name for themselves. We were, we were committing the sin of trying to make ourselves the master, and God knows that he is the source of life for us. And we, there is even evidence, even in those few chapters of Scripture, to show that we, on our own power, are simply sending ourselves to destruction. God, in his mercy, knows that he is the only source of life for us. And so, like so many times, oftentimes as a parent, you punish for the sake of, of giving them help and support. God scattered us so that we would rely back on him again. It was an act, a, it perhaps hidden to us, but yet God's mercy is there because he knows that the one thing that we need is him. And yet it leaves on a little bit of a cliffhanger. This section of scripture, it, it ends on this sort of, what is God going to do? He has scattered humanity. He has yet promised he's not going to destroy them. He's going to scatter them. What is this God going to do to continue this project of reclaiming people back? We have this contrast of the perfect unity of humanity with God in the Garden of Eden, and yet the separation from that. How are we going to bring ourselves back? And this is where the story continues. And so the invitation for us this summer is to continue exploring. I may have touched on one or two stories or issues or triggers that make you re-remember the difficulty you have with some of these passages. And let's engage about that. Let's wrestle with God. Let's continue to explore and see what he has for us in this. And let us also collectively hold in our imagination this tree of life, the Garden of Eden, knowing that this is the thing that God wants to bring us back to. Even today, as we now live in a New Testament time, this is still the goal. Unity of heaven and earth. The bringing of God's rule and reign on this earth. If, let us continue to desire and seek wisdom from Scripture to find our way back to that unity with God in our relationships, in our neighbors, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools. Let's seek to bring that re-harmony again that is imagined, that, has, that was lost in this section and allow this section of scripture to spur our imagination for how we can take a world that is struggling through separation from God through sin and bring it back into unity with God. Amen.